while I was in in the university, I remember going to the the chairman of the Department of Sociology, and I told him that I wanted to go and volunteer somewhere. But at that time, um, one lady who was the mother of the accountant at Pamoja Trust at that time um, was working for children's home. I told her I want to volunteer at the children's home. Then she said, oh, okay, that's really good. It would be nice for you to volunteer, but the only problem is that most of the children that we work with are actually street boys. And I, I, I can guarantee you they'll bully you. You'll have a hard time. So what, why don't I talk to my daughter, who works for an organization that, that works with uh, informal settlements? And I think the next morning, I was headed to Pamoja Trust. It was at that time that also some other people were joining Pamoja Trust. So there's also Joseph Gemani was joining Pomodja Trust at that time. So we, we joined together. And so Jack gave us the brief almost together. So then on the second day is when Jack gave us an assignment uh, with, a, with a colleague called Solomon. The brief was this an eviction happening. So the community had just gotten um, an eviction threat. So I went to my camera with no skill of community interaction, no skill on anything. I am going to do the assignments that Jack has instructed me to do. So, so whereas my, the other colleague, I think, had some bit of interpersonal skills with communities, I think there's that memo that I didn't get. So, <laughs> so me, I, I went straight, we got there, and I started recording, hmm? recording. And then I did it so well, because then I was getting different angles. So what I didn't realize that I got so engrossed in recording this community that I just kept going and walking and walking. And then I told myself, let me walk farther away from the settlement to get now a bigger picture. Because at that time, we didn't have aerial photography or we didn't have GIS images. So I thought, let me, let me draw close, I mean, um, farther from the settlement to get a better angle of how it integrates to the rest of the South Sea estate and to the airport. I mean, I had it all together. So, oh my God, I actually didn't realize I was taking myself to death. So, so as I'm recording, I'm seeing like a group of men coming towards me. But then I'm thinking, okay, when they ask me, I'm going to, you know, tell them what the plan is. And because I'm becoming so good at this filming thing, I just, you know, I'll integrate them in this whole video. I started realizing everyone is holding something. And it's not just something. The closer they get, I'm realizing they're actually holding weapons or, uh, you know, like pangas and swords or whatever they are. So I'm like, okay, well, the grass is a bit long on this side. Maybe no, <laughs> they can't cut I've come to cut the grass. So, so, so when they came, they came in the numbers and they surrounded me. So then they asked me who I am. So I told them I work for Pomodja Trust. And they asked me what am I doing. I told them I'm taking, a, I'm recording the settlement. Then they, they asked me what for. Then I told them, yeah, we you know I, I'm working for this organization. And this is what we do. This is what we want to do. Um, but then they, they, they were so agitated. And I was wondering, why are they agitated, you know? We are here to help. You know, I was from college, so I used to think that we help people, you know? You're, you're like professional, so you help people. Later I was to learn, to, to see and notice that the young men had, were under the influence of something, either alcohol or whatever they had taken. So the agitation was also being, was getting crazier as I responded or said whatever I was saying. So then um, somebody called me from the office or rather someone called me, my phone rang. And, and I knew that it was gonna be rude for me to just pick the call. So what I did is I picked the phone, but I didn't speak. So I picked the phone and I just held it on my hands. So the person on the other side of the line, someone could follow the conversations. And I think that's how the office knew there was a problem, because then they could follow the conversations of what was happening. So, but then later again, I was to learn that it was the office that I called because they had been called by somebody in the settlement to tell them that we hear you have sent some two people to the settlement and I think they're in trouble, so you need to come and get them. So the old man who had been interviewing me left. He just walked away and I think signaled these young men to do whatever they want to do with me. Because these other guys didn't look good at all. They, did, they look bad. They look bad. They, they, 
they, you know, they were looking like hungry to use their weapons. And when, when I look around where I was, behind me was the National Park. <laughs> behind me was the National Park. So even though I was to run away, <laughs> the rogue lions were like right behind me. So, and then this other side was the airport. Of course, you can't just jump into the airport. So you'll be arrested. So I have the airport, the National Park and my would-be killers so <laughs> so i guess this is, where, this is where life ends for me so i was like okay wow it's been barely 48 hours <laughs> it's been barely 48 hours of, of working then at that time i think that what the office did because then the office was was communicating with some of the very few people in that settlement that were federation the very countable people that were in the Federation at that time in the settlement. So what, what they did is that they sent, I think, two guys. Two guys came, and just immediately when the old man left, two guys came, and then they started talking, talking to this young man out of doing whatever they wanted to do. I don't know if they wanted to kill me or to beat me up or whatever. So in that commotion, somebody just told me, just walk. Walk away while they are still, um, while they are still arguing with these two men. Just walk away. So, adrenaline tells me it's true. Walk away. So, so I started walking away. So I just walked away slowly, slowly. Then I turned. I realized that I sort of made some good distance. So then I started running. Then at some point, I found a guy who told me, use this route. If you use this route, it takes you to the formal estate. If you use this route, they'll get you. So anyway, so I ran and it led me to the formal estate. And then within the formal estate, there was a bus stop. And then there was a bus that was just ready to take off. So I just got into the bus. And I didn't know where the bus was going, but I just got into it. So, so luckily, the bus was going to town. So I found myself in town. And then I had the equipment with me. So... I went straight to my mom, who had helped me get this internship. <laughs> so I told her, by the way, I'm going back to college. Yeah, I think this working industry, this working sector is not for me. Within the afternoon, I got a call from the office. And Jack called me and Jack is like, so where are you? But I always find that the fact that I went back to the office, had made us such a huge difference because that's why I now began to understand many things. So we, we all found ourselves in the office and started talking about this experience. And I remember we were with Jack and Joseph Kemani and Francis Getao and Salma, I think, and Salma Sheba. And, and we started a conversation. I, and I don't think they were trying to convince me, but they got me to begin to understand the struggle of the land, the land struggle. It was 2002. The struggle on, on land was exactly that. There was a lot of private sector interests coming into public land. And there also was communities looking for places where they could live. So there was a, con there was a, there was a contest over land. And civil society organizations at that time were then caught in that place where then they needed to protect the interest of the public. Not the interest of the public land, the interest of the public. So I, I always just feel it was just the best thing for me to get to understand this work. Because if I never went through that, I never under, understood what a fear of eviction is. Because part of the fear I had was the fear of death. But when people are going through evictions, there's a fear of death as well. You don't know whether you will, you will die in the process or you don't know whether you will lose all that you've consolidated over time. So there's a certain fear that's so, that was so pivotal for me at that time to begin to understand this.